Hello, and welcome to episode 50, uh, episode 30 of A Book or Two to Review, and it's A Fight for the Fjords. And this one's a good one, although you are going to get some confusing fun times because there is both an Admiral Vivian going around and a Captain Vian. And God bless them. Occasionally, <laughs> occasionally they get their Vivians and their Vians mixed up in their translations. But this is an absolutely amazing book. It is, of course, the... Britannia Naval Histories of World War II, so it's the National Archives documents. If you want to understand the battle for the fjords, the fight for the fjords, as the Royal Navy understood it, in their own words, the Royal Navy as they understood it, in their own words, and as they were thought at the time, this is the best book for you to go to read. Because it is basically all the summaries of their after action reports as they put together. Um, you know, you have things like I can't barely believe I'm reeling this as well. Meanwhile, you know, Sir Charles Robertshire had received particulars of the Trondheim defences, estimates of the German and Norwegian strengths and troops in, um, in about Trondheim, and use of the Germans to seize the uh, coastwise batteries at the entrance of the Trondheim Ford, which is where they were only a mile and a half wide, leading out of the Skurren Ford, two and a half miles wide. He answered Admiralty a uh, message in his, uh, his 1733 on 15th. What is size of force to be landed? What is precise position in which it is proposed to land them? What is precise position of Prondheim Aerodrome? I have no sure map. What role is role of first cruiser squadron? Are they at present doing very useful uh, uh, as they are at present doing very useful work at Kirkins in accordance with AT 0054 on the 14th? If Furious is to be used, she will have to proceed to base to re-equip the squadron, replenish stores, and embark fighter squadron, and she cannot leave before refueling at Tromso, 17th April earliest. This will also deprive Narvik of air cooperation, so suggest glorious. I think you misunderstood my 1157-14. I do not anticipate any great difficulty from the naval side, except that I cannot provide air defence for transports whilst approaching and carrying out an opposed landing, the chief air menace, air menace being from Ju-88 machines from Germany, and I know from personal experience what an opposed landing is like even without air opposition. Very useful having Sir Charles Forbes there. I like Sir Charles Forbes. I do not like Cork and Ori. Sir Charles Forbes knows what he's doing. Naval force required would be valiant and renowned to give air defence to Glorious. Yes, they fought HMS Valiant and HMS Renown would provide air defence for Glorious. This is the beginning of World War II, remember? They're still working out, but there again, if you consider even later in war, the Americans are using battleships pretty much as floating AA flat, AA flat batteries with as many guns on them as they can to provide defense for their carriers. It's the same going on here. War Spike to carry out shore bombardments, as she is the only 15 inch ship in the fleet with 6 inch guns. At least four AA cruisers. About 20 destroyers and numerous landing craft. Uh, H, I request on my return to Scarpa on the morning of 18th April, DCNS or Admiral Holland may be there to discuss the whole situation. The answer to this came on 080250 on the 17th April, of which this is at the just A and B, one brigade of regulars to take aerodrome by assault, a thousand Canadian troops, part, uh, part to capture forts, part to land near Holmvik, and part to contact Norwegians near Lengvar. 200 Royal Marines to assist in the capture of forts. Obviously, they are landing supermen. I'm presuming the Canadians are the uh, second coming of Superman, and I can only think that the 200 Royal Marines are Martian manhandlers. See, the true position of Varian's aerodrome is 63 degrees 27 north, 10 degrees 56 east. 
Uh, the first cruiser squadron, not certain, but detailed plan may prove them necessary. We must be prepared to put everything into this operation. E and F, Arc Royal and Glorious to be used. With a total of 45 fighter machines, Furious not required. G, do you propose to relieve War Spike by Water Repulse, or would you like a resolution to do so? H, Admiral Hond and the General Commanding Hammer's troops would come to Scarpa on eighth April and provide a degree, provided agreement on general scope of operation is reached today, otherwise on 19th April. Rear Admiral Holland arrived aboard the Rodney on Scar at Scarpa on the 18th of April, bringing with him a plan of operations, but the General Commanding the assault troops, Major General Hot Black, had suddenly fallen in London, and Major General Bernie Ficklin, hastily appointed to succeed him, was seriously injured to go to his staff when this his aircraft crashed on landing at Houston Airfield on 9th April. The plan, as originally conceived, had been altered to meet representations by Sir Giles Forbes, so that all the assisting forces would be carried in men of war instead of transports, and was summarised by him as follows. Details of Embarkation Force, Recife, 21st April, Divisional Headquarters in W Cruiser, Brigade Headquarters in C Battalion, 15th Brigade in X Cruiser, and 5 Destroyers, Canadian Battle Battalion in 2 Destroyers and 5 Sloops. All cruisers to carry appointed 300, approximately 300 men and 30 tons of stores each. Cruisers A, Y, and Z also to carry a two armoured landing craft and should therefore be Southampton class, because they had the davits for it. An interesting thing which had been worked into them and their design, that they could carry the armoured landing craft. Cruiser X should be a Southampton or York class. Maneuverability. In, uh, three. In addition, a Royal Marine battery of seven 3.7-inch howitzers to be embarked, three gun stores and crews, and half a battery headquarters in each X, Y, and Z cruiser, one gun and crew in X cruiser. Uh, four. Destroyers carrying Canadians to carry 100 men with blankets, tents, and seven days' rations. Remaining destroyers to carry 100 men, blankets, and 48 hours' rations. V. Soups to carry 150 men each with blankets and tents and seven days' rations. Six. Ships embark uh, concerned to embark high HE ammunition before sailing, as arranged by Commander-in-Chief Recife and Flag Officer in Charge Greenock. Seven. Time of arrival, troops gear to be signalled in due course. B. Details of embarkation of reserve, 147th Brigade. Eight. Naval base staff and stores embark on 19th April in Solitsky and Duchess of Athol at Clyde and in steamship Orion are safe. These troops with blankets, tents, and seven days' rations to be transferred at Scarpa, 21st April, to cruiser detail. Nine. Uh, nine. Subinsky to embark one new type motor landing craft, and on sea, one old armoured motor landing craft, both ex-SS Empire, after daylight. This was not an easy or quick operation. This was not something which they were just chucking together. It was something which they had thought about. It was something which they cared a great deal about organising, and this book, as the whole series are, is absolutely amazing for that. You turn to the back and you find the pink slips here. Where the ships are, what they're doing, it is full of content, full of information. Fourth destroyer flotilla, and it's listed here. Eight four point seven uh, eight point four point seven inch guns, four twenty one inch tubes. Captain PLV and DS uh, DSO. Sixth destroyer flotilla, led by HMS Somalia with RSG Nicholson in charge. <clears throat> Submarine Command under Vice Admiral Sir Max, Hort uh, Max K. Horton. You have a huge force being organized and mobilized. Which is one of the really interesting things about this. The more you read of this, and the more you see the preparation the British are putting into it, and the more you look at it from the uh, German perspective, and trust me, there are going to be some books in this, uh, books coming up soon, which are going to look at it from the German perspective. The more you realize what a gambler was for the Germans. 
the more you realize that, frankly, it was amazing they pulled it off. More power to them for actually managing to pull it off, yay. But they shouldn't have. There are numerous points at which they could have been stopped. The British were caught on the hop. A day either way. And the Germans would have probably run into a significant British force sitting there in the ocean going, Hello, there are German destroyers coming towards us. We will take them out. And then after taking them out, there's a lot of people on these ships. They really overcrew. It's like the French and Napoleon Wars. Oh, they're soldiers. I wonder why there were soldiers there. I wonder why. And the same, you know, you know, either way, it would have been really quite disastrous for the Germans. So they are incredibly lucky. And then you get to Norway, and literally that morning, Denmark has been invaded, and Norway has decided to go, we're going to go for a slow mobilization. If any clue was there that this was not going to be a slow war, there is the invasion of Denmark, which is more of a blitzkrieg in many ways than the invasion of France. Because the invasion of France is blitzkrieg only from the perspective that they don't stop to actually take on supplies, which is why they run out of supplies. They don't stop when they're supposed to. Whereas Denmark, there are no stops position for supplies because there are no supplies. Everything's going to the French front. Everything's going, uh, going elsewhere. They're not doing Denmark because they're doing Denmark. They're getting it out of the way before it becomes a potential problem. Honestly, they're invading Denmark more as a stepping stone to get to Norway. If you think about the prizes, Denmark's a prize for food, but control of Denmark doesn't strategically give them anything. In terms of the war, control of Norway, that gives them access to iron ore from Sweden, that gives them a leveraging point on Sweden, that gives them an access into the North Atlantic, that gives them access to the Arctic Oceans, all sorts of things. If they're going for an eventual war with Russia, Norway is great because it can stop supply. So directly in between Britain and Russia, you can stop supplies going back and forth. Because let's be honest, if anyone's really thinking things through, Britain is well known for making allies of and the enemy of my enemy is your my friend. Eh, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. I have to say my one problem with this book, and my one problem with this, all this things is, in many ways, it's quite... They try to be as polite as possible about Lord Cork and Ori. On the first of May, the Admiralty ordered Lord Cork to send a, a destroyer to Mo to prevent an enemy landing, and made the excellent proposal to the Commander-in-Chief Holmesley's that the destroyer division should be established to patrol the coast from Namsos to northward to prevent the movement of enemy troops ships by sea. Unfortunately, owing to a shortage of destroyers, this suggestion could not be carried out. Next, uh, um, two flying boats were sent from the United Kingdom to reconnoitre the airfields in the Bodo area, but they were caught in the water and put out of action by enemy aircraft on the 4th of May. Next military landing took place at Mo, situated ahead of North Orleans and the Ford, some 45 miles to north of Mosin. The troops considered a first independent company. 300 men all doubled the strength of an ordinary Italian company, which arrived from the United Kingdom in the transport Royal Oysterman, escorted by the Mohawk on 4th of May, and accompanied their landing apparently unobserved. Accomplished the landing apparently unobserved. Three more independent companies went out a few days after the party for Mo. Two companies to Mojan and the Ulster Prince, with Colonel Govins, the senior officer of all those outlying forces, and one to Bodo in the Royal Scotsman. They sailed from home together, escorted by four destroyers, 
parting company off the coast of Norway to go to their prospective destinations. Both landed on the Life of May, and the Ulster Prince brought away the Chess and Orpins from Mersham. Altogether, five independent companies went to Norway. The last arrived at Boat Moten on 13th and 14th May in the Royal Est Ulsterman, escorted by the Metable. Tribal class destroyers proving the very useful system of going in. Now, on the 4th of May, Lord Cork had asked the Admiralty to explain the general policy regarding Bodo, Mo, and Motion, saying also <coughs> it seems most important to hold in force the Mo Road leading north, but it appears the forces being sent are hardly adequate for this purpose. And with such weak detachments in the air, in, in the air another naval compartment commitment comes into being. The Admiralty answered on 5th of May, as Lord Cork reports, that it is not possible to maintain large forces in face of enemy air superiority well in advance of established fighter production. That border was the only place south of Narvik where such could be established, that small parties only would be maintained at Moa Mosen, with the object of obstructing enemy advance to prevent landings by sea and air. On the 7th of May, the government put the independent companies directly under the Narvik command. The Germans were then pressing northward. The Norwegians in those parts were tiring, and as soon as he arrived at Mosen on 9th of May, Colonel Gunn seems to have decided he must begin to withdraw, agreeably to his instructions to harass and delay the enemy, but to, uh, to go back gradually to Mo and Bodo. Thereupon, Lord Cork arranged to send reinforcements, apparently anticipating a signal from home, which ran thus, essential Bodo should be held pending full examination of problem involved, which is now in progress, if necessary, garrison must be reinforced by resources, from resources at your disposal. At the only time, Lord Cork asks an excellent time to manage during war. Uh, in the nicest way, Lord Cork is, to an extent, running one of the things that he's a bit defeated before it's even begun. He tries. He's very trying. But he's not up to World War Two. A lot of officers aren't. This is an excellent book. And highly recommended. Uh, this whole series is highly recommended by me. You know, I rave about it regularly. Mainly because I love going to National Archives. Pre-COVID, I was in there once a week. Now... I'm slowly getting a hang of the booking system, but again, going is always a risk with my family and all these sort of things, so I'm careful about it. And there's only so many hours in a day. Unfortunately. So books like that really, really make my life so much easier. They're not a fully digitalized archive. That would always be lovely. But they are the next best thing. In that there is close a primary source material of archive documents as I can get without actually having to visit the archives. And that means that I can use that time if I budget it to visit other archives, which is always useful. Because there are, each archive has something different they offer. And this is, again, a joy of doing historical research. For me, the National Archives is very close to where I live. That's one of the advantages of where I live. National Archives are about 40 minutes drive from home. They're viable by train. If you don't mind changing at Clapham Junction. Which can be interesting, but we'll leave that to one side. And for those who don't know Clapham Junction, look it up. Look it up. But there are lots of other archives which are a long way away from home. Newcastle. Liverpool. We're all. Glasgow. Where I've just been, Falmouth. Down in Cornwall. 
lots of archives all around the country. Oxford, Cambridge, all around the country there are archives. And they're worthwhile visiting. But <laughs> they are and always will be timed resources because it's how much time do you get in them and what you prioritize looking at. And it depends, therefore, on the quality of the sources, your list of sources and the source names and descriptions, how you prioritize them. Something like this becomes useful because a book which is like this, which is a compilation of primary source material written out, can give you an idea of what names and what things to look for. You look through this and suddenly, hang on, maybe Operation Mo or Mo Deployment or Independent Companies actually has value for my research. It did. To be honest, I found that out when I looked through the National Archive version as well than the book version as. But now I have the book version as. There might be other things I go through and find. And that's where these, the real advantage of this sort of book comes into its own, because you can explore them at your leisure. And it's not photographs you've taken on a screen you're reading through and staring at a screen, it's a book. So it's a lot easier on your eyes to read, and it's a lot something you can do pleasurably in the garden or wherever you find five minutes. So these are really good for anyone who's interested in naval history. They are really good for anyone who's interested in government, uh, government records. And they are incredibly useful for anyone who's researching and writing about naval history as starting points. Highly recommend them. Hope you enjoyed. That was part episode 30 of a book or two to review, Fight for the Fjords. And it's the Battle for Norway, 1940. At Britannia, Naval Histories of World War II Collection, published by the University of Plymouth Press.